Hello, I'm Todd Sink. I'm an assistant professor here at Texas A&M University in the Department of Wildlife and Fisheries Sciences. I'm also one of three regional fisheries extension specialists for the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service. If you're watching this video, you either already have sent in a water sample or are considering sending in a water sample from your pond, lake, well, or other water source to our Soils, Water, and Forage Testing Laboratory in the Department of Soil Sciences here at Texas A&M University. Interpretation of these water quality reports and how they relate to your fish population can be a difficult task. So today we're going to try and help you understand how these reports relate to your fishery. For help interpreting these water quality reports, you can always contact your local county agricultural or natural resources extension agent, or you can contact the fishery specialist for your district or region. When filling out the cover sheet for the Soil, Water, and Forage Laboratory, please include all mandatory information located at the top of the page. Include your payment, and if you're filling out a report that you would like tested for an aquaculture or fisheries issue, please check the box labeled aquaculture, or in the comment box below, please include the fishery-related issue, such as a fish die-off. The Wildlife and Fisheries Department does not generate any additional reports or contact the submitter, but is available to explain water quality and how it pertains to your fishery, along with any other relevant information by phone or email. This video will walk you through the basics of the water analysis report and also explain how the results of the report may relate to your pond or fishery. Here we have a report where the landowner marked the aquaculture box. Some of the first items that a fisheries extension specialist will look at when interpreting your report are the calcium, carbonate and bicarbonate, pH, hardness, and the alkalinity. The first item we will look at today is calcium, which is located at the top of the list. The desired range for calcium is more than 20 milligrams per liter, or parts per million. The acceptable range is more than 5 parts per million. Often, we like to see at least 10 parts per million before it can be considered a viable fishery. If it does not have at least 5 parts per million, then amendments will need to be made to your water, such as the addition of calcic agriculture lime. Calcium is an essential element for fish osmoregulation, skeletal and scale formation, and is also critical for egg and larval development. Poor levels of calcium can impede proper development of offspring, ultimately resulting in poor offspring recruitment for the fishery. The next items we will look at are sodium and chloride ion concentrations combined. More importantly, we'll be looking at the total dissolved salts. Ideally, we need to see total dissolved salts below 10 parts per thousand or 10,000 parts per million. The reason for this is that most of our freshwater species survive well in pond water that contains up to 10 parts per thousand salinity, but above this salinity, you'll start to see issues with the survival of some of your species. Often, if salinities are too high, then you may want to look into stocking some marine species that are more suitable for marine environments, such as hybrid striped bass or even red drum. Chloride can also be too low in a pond. Preferably, we would like to see chloride concentrations above 50 parts per million, and 100 parts per million is best. The reason for this is that chlorides play an important role in the prevention of brown blood disease, which can occur in the winter. A common amendment that we will suggest if your chloride levels are too low is to add common stock salts, which is non-iodized salt sold for livestock purposes. This addition can help to raise your chloride concentrations up to the desired level. Next we will discuss alkalinity. Alkalinity in general is a measure of the concentration of buffers in your water. The desired range for alkalinity is between 50 and 150 parts per million. In general, alkalinity of above 20 parts per million is acceptable. However, we strongly recommend the addition of agricultural lime to increase your alkalinity. Alkalinity greater than 400 parts per million can be detrimental to your fish as well. If alkalinity is greater than 400 parts per million, a common amendment is the addition of gypsum. Gypsum adds calcium to the water, which reacts with the alkalinity, causing a portion of it to settle out as limestone. Alkalinity and pH are strongly linked together. For pH, a desirable range for fish is between 6.5 and 9. The acceptable range can be lo as low as 5.5 all the way up to 10. Alkalinities outside of this range are detrimental to both fish growth and larval development. One of the most common things we see is low alkalinity, resulting in low pH. The most common amendment we would suggest in this situation is, again, the addition of agricultural lime. 
Here we see hardness, which is strongly linked to the calcium and alkalinity content of the water. Optimal hardness is between 50 and 150 parts per million. However, the acceptable range is more than 20 parts per million. If the hardness and alkalinity of your water is too low, a common amendment is to add agricultural lime. If the alkalinity is within the desired range, add gypsum to boost the calcium hardness. One of the largest points of confusion on these reports is that the hardness is listed twice. Here we can see hardness listed as grains of calcium carbonate per gallon, and here we see it listed as parts per million of calcium carbonate. Really, our concern is the hardness report in parts per million of calcium carbonate. These two units are essentially the same measure of hardness, but in different units. Each grain of calcium carbonate per gallon is roughly equivalent to 17 parts per million of calcium carbonate. So they're basically two different ways to measure the same thing. But if we focus primarily on the hardness in parts per million, that should be our focus in terms of our fishery. Here we see the magnesium concentrations in the water. Magnesium is generally not limited in fresh water, although it may require supplements in some brackish or marine pond environments. Next on the list we see sodium. Sodium is a major salt constituent of water. In general, we like to see a relatively low sodium concentration. You generally do not need to concern yourself in freshwater environment unless the sodium concentration exceeds 3,000 parts per million. In many areas in Texas, we have high salt contents in the soil as well as in the water, so your sodium content may be higher than 1,000 parts per million. Boron is often a topic of concern for pond owners because here in Texas, some of our groundwater has exceptionally high boron concentrations when compared to other parts of the country. It is not uncommon to see boron concentrations in excess of 10 parts per million. While we do know boron can concentrate in water and in the soils of the pond bottom, there are no immediately known detrimental effects to your fish population or recommended concentration limits. Here we see the sulfate concentration in the water. Like boron, groundwater and well water in Texas can have higher than normal concentrations. Sulfate can range from 0 to 1,000 parts per million. It's generally not a concern for your fish population, but it may be of concern if the water is being used for other purposes, such as watering livestock or irrigating crops. In here, we see nitrate concentrations in the water. Nitrate, unlike nitrite and ammonia, is relatively non-toxic to fish. In general, nitrate concentrations in pond water are between 0 and 10 parts per million, but can be as high as 50 parts per million if the fish are heavily fed or an excess of feed is left in the pond. The next item we see here is phosphorus. Phosphorus can become a concern to pond owners not because of its effect on fish, but because of its effect on aquatic vegetation. Phosphorus is the most limiting element to plant growth in freshwater. Therefore, we like to see phosphorus concentrations generally low unless there's a good algae bloom that has developed already. Phosphorus concentrations less than one part per million are generally acceptable. When phosphorus concentrations exceed one part per million, we can start to see excessive plant growth if a good algae bloom has not developed. Depending on if you're getting your water quality report from Texas A&M or another university, the units may differ. Just remember that parts per million, indicated by ppm, is equal to milligrams per liter. After reviewing your water analysis report and viewing this video, you can often see that most waters within the state fall within the acceptable categories for fish within the state of Texas. However, if you do find that your water has an issue with a chemical component that lies outside of the normal or acceptable ranges for fish production, feel free to contact your fisheries extension specialist for further help. For further information on your test results or the chemical analysis used, please contact Tony Proven or John L. Pitts at the Soils, Water, and Forage Testing Laboratory.